So do you want to just say a little bit about how did Living Options come about? It's obviously very personal to you. Can you tell the story of how Living Options came into being? I, I, after my, my injury, I had quite a few bad experiences about a range of facilities and services available to disabled people. And about the time in the early 80s, I lived independently as opposed to residential provision. And I had the opportunity then to get involved in what was an emerging disabled people's movement and set up a small organisation in Exeter. And from that I got involved with the Prince of Wales Advisory Group on disability that had a, um, a group that called itself the Living Options Working Party. And in 1990 the funds became available by the Exeter Health Authority to establish what we called Living Options East Devon, which very much mirrored what had gone on in, in London with the Prince of Wales Advisory Group. And it pulled together all the leading organisations around the county um, that worked with disabled people from rare first climb categories. And it grew from there. We had a lot of work from statutory agencies to do. The Community Care Act was emerging and the Health and Social Services wanted to know really what their services, current service provision was providing and we did a baseline review to inform them from a user perspective about how efficient those services were and it's grown from that and those really are its origins. And over three years we established a good reputation of working with statutory agencies and with our voluntary sector partners and um, that's the kind of way we like to operate. We like to work in collaboration with rather than as a, in an adversarial way and I think um, that, that work has continued over the last 25 years. And how did your personal experience of trying to live independently um, influence what your vision was for living options? Initially it was a struggle. It was difficult. I was regarded as unusual and I wanted it to be easier for other people who followed on. And I hope that some of the work that I've been able to do with living options, through living options, and other organisations regionally and nationally has helped um, achieve that, that people living better lives, more fulfilled lives much, much earlier than was the case when I was um, first injured. And in terms of what your vision, you, you've talked quite a lot about the, the detail of what, what the first few years of Living Options was involved with. But at that stage, what was, what was your, I guess in a nutshell, your vision for, for what Living Options would achieve? Initially we had a very limited view in that we were informing the statutory sector about what they were offering. But now that I had a, a feeling at the, as, we, as, we, as we did our work that we could become much bigger and much, much more influential in what we did and we could eventually become providers in our own right. And I thought a, a service run for disabled people by disabled people and their organisations would be very valuable. And that's very much how it's turned out to be. We are now a large-ish organisation employing over 30 people. When we started out, we had one employed member of staff and a volunteer, whereas now we're we occupy a suite of offices uh, as opposed to that, to one single um, office space. And um, that demonstrates, I think, the range of, of services that we now offer. And I hope that's a benefit to a large number of people, as, as demonstrated by the, those that we have on our um, databases and those that we help support in one way or another. And over the 25 years, obviously a lot of projects 
um, and work has taken place. What's given you the most pleasure in terms of the outcomes of Living Options work? I think it's been particularly pleasing that we very right early in the piece identified the need for specialist work with people who had sensory loss and deprivation and we were able to establish some very specialist work with them, people with sight and hearing loss or impairment and people who are profoundly deaf and use British Sign Language and I think that's been a, a particular breakthrough for us and it's helped us achieve a better understanding of the needs of those people and I hope we cater particularly well for them or we set out to do so and I think that's been a major change in how we operate and it's been very instructive at the reaction we've had from statutory agencies about how they provide services and how they respond to those particular client groups and the kinds of services like advocacy which weren't anywhere on the horizon 25 years ago are extremely valuable for people who, who would like to have a voice but find themselves somewhat marginalised now have an opportunity to have their say and, and are supported in, in um, getting their views across. So I think there are some significant changes in that, in that um, decade, two decades and a half. And going forward, what do you feel are the most important things for Living Options to, to be focusing on? What do you think are the, the priorities? Barriers, I suppose, to independent living still exist. I think people's horizons are limited still. I think expectations are still relatively low and levels of understanding amongst the wider community are, are limited as to what disabled people have the capability of achieving and I think if we could improve that even further and I think major steps have been taken since the year of disabled people in 1981 I think it would be a major achievement on our behalf we still haven't really penetrated that particular sector of the market if I can refer to it as such and I think if we could do that we would be um, making a major breakthrough.